to the London panel here. I mean, because we have limited time and we want to give a lot of time to questions, I'm going to ask them if they don't mind to speak just for five minutes. Um, Sarah Pantoliano, please, first. Thank you. Um, thank you, and thank you very much to Dr. Tijani and Dr. Mutre for their comments. Um, I just want to comment very briefly on Darfur, but then focus mostly on, uh, on the border areas. I'd like to just concentrate on the humanitarian um, side of the discussion. I'll leave the political comments to William. I think that is appropriate. Um, and just you know, reflect a little bit on what the situation is uh, and, and, and perhaps try and open the discussion to where we can go and more realistically you know, um, can be done to take steps towards addressing the humanitarian situation, particularly in the border areas. But let me touch briefly on Darfur. I was uh, um, very interested to hear how the DRA is uh, planning to uh, support, you know, the returnees. And indeed, you know, the latest humanitarian update released by OCHA documents that there have been about 109,000 verified IDP returns in Darfur and 31,000 refugee returns from Chad. So there is there is definitely movement back to Darfur. And um, as Dr. Tijani said, it's very important that, you know, services are provided before uh, people can, you know, fully return. I mean, the experience of returning other parts of uh, Sudan, you know, after the signing of the, the CPA, it, it's uh, a testimony to how important it is to make sure that people are supported with services if uh, returns are to be uh, durable. But the other side of this is obviously um, ensuring that people have access to livelihoods, and the main livelihoods in many rural parts of Darfur is land. Um, and uh, you know, I'd like to ask Dr. Dijani for some comments on how the DRA is planning to address the land question, because obviously there has been a lot of secondary occupation of land. And if people don't have access to land, don't have access to farming, their ability to you know, access uh, livelihood sources in rural areas will remain minimal. And so the returns may be very short-lived. So I'd like you know, to hear how you're planning to address that. The it's, it's a very difficult and complex issue, but actually it's at the heart to ensuring the returns um, can be durable. Um, but I'd like to touch on, on the border areas, and um, particularly on South Kordofan. As Dr. As Dr. Mutriff said, um, the situation in South Kordofan is very serious from a humanitarian perspective. You know, we know, we can only anticipate um, the extent to which needs will become even greater as the rain season sets in and as the, you know, the hunger gap um, start. I mean, the hunger gap is always a problem in parts of South Kordofan, but after two failed farming seasons, this is going to be, um, you know, a lot harder. Um, now, you've talked about, you know, the situation in the government areas, the, the assessment has been done by the government and WFP, and even, you know, in part of the government areas, we know that there are pockets of malnourishment, um, and I think was the, the rates were about 13% in the assessment. But obviously, we don't have information about the situation in the um, SPLM North Control there is no you know, independent verified sources. What we know though from the refugees that have arrived in South Sudan, and we're talking about 130,000 do document registered refugees in, in South Sudan, is that <coughs> the level of, of um, uh, acute and severe malnutrition is actually quite high. Um, and that, you know, people are resorting to you know, eating a lot of wild fruits, insects, um, mice and, and so forth. And of course, there are very serious protection issues because people are exposed to both ground and, and the air warfare systematically. Um, now, I, it's fully understandable that you know, there is a concern from a security perspective that you know, humanitarian aid can be used for military purposes. On the other hand, there is a very strict imperative to make sure that the civilians <laughs> you know, do not suffer. Um, you referred, Dr. Mutrif, to the proposal that had been made by the African Union, the League of Arab States, and the UN about, you know, these, you know, tripartite mechanisms to verify and <coughs> ensure, you know, that humanitarian assistance could be provided to both government and SPLM uh, north controlled areas of, uh, of South Kordofan. You said that you know this was welcome, but actually, since February, there hasn't been much progress on this mechanism. And it would be great to hear whether this is an avenue that can be pursued uh, more systematically, um, you know, to ensure that aid can be provided in a, in a you know, sort of verified manner to all parts of the state and to Blue Nile as well. I would add. Um, now. In South Kordofan in particular, we've, we've experimented with tripartite mechanisms in the past, and they've worked really well. I mean, I used to lead the UN operation that was jointly run with HAC and the SSRC. So, you know, there is, there is some capital there on which to build, and I'd be really interested to hear your comments on what steps we can 
take practically to make sure that you know we open up assistance to the civilians as soon as possible in the state thank you um, well, william bain i gather has to leave